we were this this obscure place somewhere where almost no no one came here, and you know we are 330,000, and, and there are like a couple of million tourists per year. So it's, it's just a it's, it's, it's a different feeling now being here. Tell our audience who you are and what you do. Well, my name is Jon Helgi Thoranesson. I'm a biologist and spent all my life designing MMOs for, for companies around the world. In very general terms, mm. um, what should I know about the history of Iceland? You know, officially it's in, in uh, 984 when the first, you know, big expedition with a lot of ships and, you know, farm animals and everything you needed, you know. There were some Irish monks here. We don't know very much about them, but there are some, some places in Iceland named after them. Uh, Pape and, 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 and so on. But the only mention of them in the, in the sagas or in the books is that uh, the Vikings came and just cleared them out. <laughs> Basically, they just killed everybody. So, because, yeah, yeah. And settled the country. So, yeah, we were, we were, we had some, some Catholic virgins living here, you know, for, for, for who knows how long, but uh, maybe it, it may be like tens of years or hundred years. There are no records really. So uh, I guess the first wave then of settlement were the Vikings. Yeah, yeah, and, and that was a mixed bag too. I mean, they were, they were, most of them were from Norway, and uh, most of them came. Uh, just uh, left Norway in a, you know, or just packed everything and left. Like these uh, these small chiefs that didn't want to submit to to uh, uh, the kings that were trying to uh, gather Norway into one state. So they came here, you know, a lot of educated people also among them and settled. So this is a period where Pagan and Christian people were sort of living here. Yeah, yeah. And if, when you read when you read the uh, the sagas and and the, and the literature that that exists from that day, that doesn't have, seem to be an issue until Olav uh, Tryggvason, uh, I think he was called, the king of Norway, tried to wanted to to um, annex Iceland uh, around the year thousand, and then he used the excuse that, that most of the people here were pagan and he was going to come here and, and Christian them and, and take over. So, um, yeah, so, so then it's, you know, obviously became an issue what you were. The parliament in Iceland was, was uh, started in 930. It's the oldest parliament in, 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 in Europe that is still working. And, uh, and they met in, I think it was the year 999 rather than 1000 that they, they met at the parliament and just decided you know, to become Christian. So, so they would get rid of the, the, the king, the Norwegian king was trying to, to take over. This is such a remarkable, like I've been learning a little bit about this sort of turning point yeah. in Icelandic yeah. history. And I mean, it's remarkable for a number of reasons. First of all, the, the, the idea that an entire country would sort of convert overnight. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it didn't convert overnight. They, 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 they agreed to take Christianity, and then there were some appendixes to that, that law. Like and footnotes. Like footnotes, yeah. You could, you could, you could, uh, you could carry out unwanted children, uh, you could eat horse flesh, and you could worship the old gods if you didn't tell anyone. <laughs> that was basically it. So, you know, yeah. And it's, a, it's you know it's probably a nice way to do it because you know if if you were going to do it like all at once, half of the nation would you know go bananas and start quarrelling and fighting over it. And the person so, in parliament who was responsible for this decision wasn't a Christian, is that right? No, 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 no. They were, uh, uh, as I said, most of them were pagan. Uh, this was just a purely political thing. Right. And uh, it was the thing, the thing is with paganism is uh, is that. You know, there's not, there wasn't, there wasn't any, anyone, you know, all-knowing God. And they weren't necessarily good, and they weren't necessarily evil. They were, they were essentially very human. 
And instead of like dictating what, how you should live your life and what you should do and so on, uh, all the stories about them were about you know, them making mistakes and then people should learn from that. You know, it, it's a different way of thinking about religion. And uh, so it wasn't probably a big deal for them to, to take this new guy, you know. <laughs> and it was smart in the sense that it allowed them to maintain a yeah, form that, of independence. Yeah, yeah. In 1270, um, the, uh, the climate also started to change, the actual weather climate. Oh. Yeah, it started becoming colder. And it, it's called, it, up here it's called the Little Ice Age. It's, 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 from, it's from around like 1250, 1300 and until, until actually, you know, around 1900. It was very, very cold, and, and the first people who came here, they were, they were harvesting uh, uh, corn and, and, and growing all sorts of things that was completely impossible for a very long period after, you know, during the Middle Ages. And there were also um, periods where no ships came here. There were like a 60-year period once when not a single ship came from, from mainland Europe. And uh, you can just imagine how, you know, the situation in a country where you can't grow any corn and you don't have any, you know, there's no sugar, no, you know, nothing, you know, and, and timber, not the least, because we don't have, we never, we don't have any trees to speak of, not, nothing that you could build really a house of from. And uh, so, yeah, 60 years without a single nail coming into the country, it's, uh, yeah, that's not. It's hard to imagine, really. So, in this period of colonization, we're talking mostly about Denmark. Well, first Norway. Uh, and then uh, the Kalmar Union was made, which was like Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. And, uh, and then that broke up. And, there, you know, it's a long story. But, but we ended up under Denmark eventually. Um, and uh, as I said, the, 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 we were out here, um, the Norwegian king and the Danish king uh, were busy fighting some other people, you know, and Iceland was very often just left to its own devices. So even and, when it was colonized? Yeah, even when it was colonized. Iceland d didn't have an army then and doesn't have an army now? And, and Iceland never has had an army. We just, well, you know, the, the, the policy has been just, if somebody comes, we're just going to be a pain in the ass for, <laughs> for a while, and they will eventually leave, you know, and nobody will die. You know, it's quite sensible, I think. It seems to have worked yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. What were the circumstances around which people here said, all right, we've had it, no more Denmark? Yeah, yeah. Well, we had, we had a movement starting in the late 1800s and uh, like when, when uh, Iceland had managed to get people uh, to Denmark, to the two universities to get educated there. Um, and those people uh, uh, started getting connections within Denmark and raising the, the uh, you know, cause for, for, for Iceland. And then the Second World War broke out, and and Denmark is is taken over by the uh, by the Germans, and which made it very easy to kick them because they were down, you know. And then in 1944, uh, there was this referendum here, uh, where it's, it was like 98 percent of of people cast their vote, and 99 point something percent of them said, yeah, we want to break ties with Denmark. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the Danes were a little bit offended too, but uh, you know. Oh, this is what you're referring to when you said kick them when they're down, because yeah, they were yeah. occupied at oh, the yeah, time. Oh yeah, they were occupied, they couldn't do anything, so yeah, yeah. yeah. We were, yeah, rid of the Danes and on our own in, in, the, in the middle of the North, North Atlantic. When the Cold War started heating up, um, 
this was a strategically very important place. I mean, it was the biggest airplane hangar in, 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 in the Atlantic, right? So uh, uh, in 1949, uh, there's, uh, you know, the government receives a, a telegram from, from the U.S. government that there were like three naval ships on its way, on their way here to take Iceland. It was a big day in Parliament. Everybody knew that this was happening. Uh, just about one third of the population of Iceland was gathered outside the house. Uh, pretty mad about what was going to happen, you know, or at least concerned. Um, and uh, there was put forth a suggestion that that uh, we would we would just give the Americans space um, somewhere where there was always bad weather and no grass or anything, just you know, somewhere. <laughs> Which eventually, you know, what was done. But uh, this this suggestion was was uh, wasn't couldn't pass. So uh, and what what happened was that that all of a sudden there was these, these 300 policemen in the basement of the parliament and they were brought up and and uh, they escorted out I think it were like 13 uh, of from the socialist party and the communist party and the people who were like opposed and then they had the referendum, you know. So, they, so it was it was actually a coup. They removed the people who were going to vote the way they didn't yeah, want them to yeah, vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything, you know, went completely bananas around the parliament, uh, and uh, and it was the first like big political riot in Iceland history, um, and the first time of, of, of two times that 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 tear gas has been used here. But what what the government did was to, you know, find uh, the, the most inhabitable spot in Iceland, put up a big fence, and nobody was allowed in, and the Americans were not allowed out. You know, you never saw soldiers here in, in Reykjavik, for example, even though the place isn't very far away. And they kept it like that the whole whole time. During you know? the entire Cold War? Yeah, d during the entire entire period. So kind of so, like a Guantanamo Bay situation? Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah. The economic crash in 2008, was it? Yeah. And then yeah. what happened in the wake of that? If you can tell me what led to the crash and then how people reacted and what happened here as a result of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is there is this period that comes uh, leading up to it where where everything just seems to be going absolutely nuts. And, and uh, you know, people, there's just too much money you know, you can get, you can borrow money to do anything. It's called the, like the 2007 mentality. That's that's the, where anything goes, you know. And uh, we're actually approaching that fast again. But, uh, uh, and then the crash happens uh, around uh, around the uh, the world. And what happens was that, that money that Icelandic banks had been, been borrowing uh, were, they, they wanted them, wanted it paid back and they didn't have money lying around, you know, actual money. So, uh, so the banks fell one after another. And, uh, and, uh, but the thing what happened in Iceland was that, that this is a small society and uh, you don't, it's, it's very hard to, to hide away here. I think that's one of the reasons why most of our bank exec executives and, and people connected them ended up in jail. And they are still being sent to jail. I mean, only a couple of days ago, three of them were were uh, got sentenced for in the in the Supreme Court for things that happened in in 2007 and 8. That is a big uh, contrast from the country I live in. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I, I, and I guess that, that that most of the people who live in that country are wondering why the hell didn't we do this? You know, because because the main perpetrators back then who eventually led to like a world crash, you know, are still doing their thing. Yeah. You know, and, and being holier than everybody, anybody, you know, you can't, yeah. 
But here, that's not what happened. That's not what happened here, no. As I said, this is a small country, and, and, and a lot of the people in parliament and in government were either connected to people who were running, you know, the various financial institutions. Uh, and, uh, and they, not everything that they had been doing uh, could stand the light of day. So, uh, um, and they wanted to sit on, the government wanted to sit on, of course, and, and, and that was something that just wasn't going to go down with the, with the people. So, um, uh, so we started, uh, <laughs> it started with people showing up down outside parliament with like cutlery and making noise, you know, and it's called the cutlery revolution. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, it took it took several weeks. It was it was and it was a, it was a build up. You know, it was um, uh, there were more and more people that ca came, and the more and more people learned about what was happening um, and why it was happening. The more and more people were supporting it. Was this and organized activism or no? Not at all. <laughs> it was it was just it was just the mob basically. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly, I mean, there, there were there were Just some outrage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. General outrage. Uh, the further it went, uh, went. There was, of course, some. I mean, I think the most sophisticated uh, organization was that somebody, you know, this guy sends out a tweet. Let's show up there and and, and raise hell and we're there or or wherever, you know. So, but there were there wasn't any. I mean, there was. There's no single person that stands out. Who, who, who said or did anything special? It was it was just Incredible. it was just a mass movement, very uh, uh, spontaneous, really. And like me, I, I, I was I was working, I was making computer games here, and me and uh, a friends of mine there. You know, at the end of every day, we went downtown after work. Uh, went to the there was this one shop grocery store in in, in the central Reykjavik where we went always, every day, bought all the eggs they had, and then we walked up to Parliament and just handed out eggs to people so they could pelt the, you know, police or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, it was, and you could see it also. I mean, these were normal people. It was, it was uh, during night, they were, they, they, the, the, the place filled up with people. People were, were, were you know, lighting fires and, 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 you know, spraying and, you know, just, generally being a pain in the ass. Like I said, I mean, that's the athletic way <laughs> if you want to change something. Um, and uh, and this, this continued in, into the autumn. And I remember, uh, and, but it, it became harder and harder because, because uh, the, uh, the government completely refused to, to go. And uh, I think it was one or two days before they actually resigned, all of them. Uh, where the police attacked the people outside. And that was the second time we used tear gas in Icelandic history. Uh, it was just unreal being from here and standing there out on the, out on the knoll in, in front of parliament and seeing these guys coming and shooting at us, you know. And nobody expected it either. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a big space in front of, front of the parliament where, where there are like restaurants and cafes around and, and they were like full of, Tourists sitting there and eating and drinking and everything, and all of a sudden, just everything explodes. Um, and I, I, you know, they obviously realized that you know either somebody is going to get hurt or or we just, you know, go away. And uh, and then um, uh, they abdicate and and we we get a new government. So uh, they just resigned. They resigned. Yeah. Yeah. And they we, had some shame. They actually had some shame, yeah. And the guy who was prime minister uh, was sentenced. And, uh, and he was the head of the conservative party, <laughs> Geir Horte. And incidentally, he is now the, the uh, ambassador to the US. <laughs> For some strange reason, um, yeah. that actually makes a whole lot of sense yeah, given the current yeah, U.S. Yeah. administration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he just fits in well with them, I guess. When I came here, yeah. the only cultural associ associations I had with Iceland in my mind were Bjork. 
Yeah. And because I'm a huge nerd, mm. the mountain from Game of Thrones. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like people to know? I now actually appreciate that uh, Iceland has a wicked sense of humor <laughs> that I really, really appreciate. <laughs> I have some British heritage, and, okay. and so I think there's a lot simpatico yeah, there. Yeah, we, we, we are good at like sarcasm and, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> but making fun of ourselves also. I and think. irony, you appreciate yeah, irony. Yeah, irony, absolutely. Yeah. But what I what I would like from you for the last question is, if there were if there was one thing that you would like people outside of Iceland to know about Iceland's culture. What would it be? Icelanders are, are, they are always looking for something interesting and new to do, and they are not afraid to do it. You know, they're stupid enough to just throw themselves into whatever thing there is and just try it out. And if it fails, it fails, you know. So when you come here, you find people doing amazing amount of different things. And, you know, yeah, our, our music scene is absolutely amazing, you know. Uh, keeping in mind how many people live here, but I mean we have we have people doing all sorts of things I mean, we're sending You know our, our, our football team to to the World Cup from a, a nation that where where football isn't even the the most popular sport I mean it, and we are here like 300,000 is absolutely ridiculous But uh, we are also like we, are, we 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 do things when we jump onto something That's the only thing in the world until we lose interest so so people are really dedicated to what they do. And, and, and somehow we have uh, conditions here where you can do that. You're allowed to do that without running into major problems with your life, you know? You don't have to be so much afraid of, you know, getting sick or, or having your kids go to school or, you know, all that. You know, that is more or less taken care of by the state. So you don't have to be fearful of, of, of life you know, getting back at you when you're doing the things that you want to do. And uh, I think that that is, that is what makes, makes us, um, you know, succeed at weirdest things. Um, and also, you know, we think we can, do, we, we can do anything. You know, we know somewhere inside that we probably can't. And we are probably not best at it either, but why not give it a try? You know, nothing, nothing bad is going to go. At least it's going to be fun, you know. Jon, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for Thank sharing. You. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you.